And the first thing that we saw in this structure was in verses 1 through 12, the Beatitudes. And we went through those almost one at a time for several weeks. And we saw how the Beatitudes gives us this penetrating description of the inner character. The inner character and the, the witness or the inner character and the righteousness of the people who are in the kingdom of heaven. So if you want to get a description of what a true disciple looks like, this is what Jesus is laid out before us here in this sermon. He, he tells us what the disciples will look like. And then in verses 13 through 16, the Lord gives us these two powerful metaphors. They're brilliant. He, he shows us that the Christian, the true disciple, is salt and light. And by doing that, he, he impresses upon us the effects of the inner righteousness of the Christian that we should have upon the world. It's a righteousness that flows from the inside out. And that righteousness will enable us and remind us and enable us to be salt and light. We saw how the human race is decaying, putrefying, and we as believers are salt, and we're to be rubbed into the world, and we delay the decaying process. And if you've ever seen deer hunters or people of wild game, after they get the meat ready, how they'll take salt and rub it into the meat, and then they'll freeze it. But this salt adds, of course, savor to it. But in the olden days, salt was used to preserve meat. And that's the point. We are the preserving, preserving effect upon a decaying world. And my point is that if you take us out of the world, man will just simply self-destruct. I don't want to be here when the church is taken out of the world. It's going to be a terrible time. But we have this... The laying effect of putrefaction because we're salt, a preserving impact upon the world. And we're also light, and light shines in the darkness. And then today we come to verses 17 through 20. And here Jesus is giving us a summary description of the radical righteousness of the kingdom. It's not normal. It's, it's radical because we're expected to be a different kind of people uh, because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We, our reactions to the world pressing upon us will bring out a, an unexpected reaction because we've been born anew and filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And so in this section, we give, we're given several examples of how this righteousness the righteousness of the Christian and the righteousness, how righteousness of the Christian and, and of Christ, how it becomes a fulfillment of the Old Testament. There's a, con a beautiful continuity between the new and the old. And we're going to see that in part this Sunday and next Sunday. Now, there's another thing I want to point out. That I, I've done this as we've gone along, but let me remind you this morning. I think it's significant that in each of these sections, that Jesus, uh, each section becomes increasingly personal. Uh, for example, in the Beatitudes, Christ speaks in the third person. He will say, blessed are the poor in spirit. But when we come to the final beatitude and the two metaphors, Jesus switches to the second person. Blessed are you, he says. You are salt. You are light. And then we see in the applications in the coming weeks, we're going to see this. Look in, in chapter Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. We'll see this. He says, you have heard that it was said of, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, there's another change. Here it becomes, in the first person, Jesus is speaking. 
to you. He said, I tell you. Now, look, I'm speaking of a change of tenses. From the third person to the second person to the first person. And you're asking, well, why, why is this important, Pastor? Let me tell you why I think it's important. I think that the answer to it is actually given, if you flip over to Matthew chapter 7, have you ever noticed, do you remember how Matthew closes the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus finishes speaking. And then look in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. This gives us a clue as to why the tenses are important. And so it was, Matthew says in verse 7, or verse 28, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now here's my point. We know that no scribe or rabbi ever spoke the way Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. They typically spoke in the second or third person. But Christ's radical style of teaching concerning radical righteousness was personal, and it was authoritative. He was speaking as if he was the Son of God. He was God in human flesh. And Jesus had a boldness about him in his personal ministry. He did things that indicated that he was more than a great teacher, more than a rabbi, he spoke with one having divine authority. Brothers and sisters, this is important because Jesus, it's a reminder to us that each person's salvation is an individual matter. We are, no one is grandfathered in. No one will say, well, I am born a Jew, so I'm grandfathered in. No one can say, well, my great-grandfather was a Methodist pastor. I have the heritage. No one will be able to say that. No one will say, well, uh, it was a family tradition passed down, like a family heirloom. My parents were Christians. I was born in a Christian home, so I, I was always a Christian. I must be a Christian. I must be what you're talking about. But each, what I'm saying is, Jesus speaks to the individual. And each person will face God on his own terms as a man who must give an account of his life. Salvation is a personal issue. And God speaks to the individual. Now our text today, verses 17 through 20, we're, going to, we're about to read it in just a few minutes, can be divided into two sections. Verse 17 through 18 is what we're going to cover today. And it tells us about the radical righteousness of Christ and the law. What is the relationship between Christ and the law and the prophets? What is the relationship between Christ and the Old Testament? That was a partic of particular interest in Christ's day. And then, verses 19 through 20, it shifts to tell us of the radical righteousness of the Christian and the law. What is the relationship for us as Christians today and the law of God. So, first of all, Christ and the law. That's what I want to cover today, those first two verses. And now listen, by, by this time in the sermon, many of the religious leaders had become suspicious of Jesus. They had followed him, and now he's teaching this sermon. And they knew there was something about him in his teaching and interaction with people that seemed to indicate that this man wanted to set aside the law and the prophets. Now, in the New Testament, that phrase is used often, the law and the prophets, and the New Testament writers, when using it, are referring to the Old Testament scriptures that they had in their possession 
that day, that the, the scribes would have in their possessions, that would be read in the temple, that would be read in the various synagogues scattered around the Roman Empire. Individuals wouldn't have a copy, but the copies of Scripture were precious. And when we speak of the Law and the Prophets, we're referring to the copy of the Old Testament that the Jews would have in their possessions during that time, the Old Testament. And the religious leaders were beginning to suspect that Jesus is coming now and he's going to teach something entirely new and recommend that they set aside the Old Testament. We can put aside the Law and the Prophets because I'm here with a new message. That's their suspicion. One of the things that he did that seemed to indicate that he was going in that direction was he did some things that were not very uh, accepted in his time. Uh, that he broke, he broke Jewish tradition in his actions. For example, Jesus would spend time with women. Uh, when women, when he would come to a town and teach and preach, uh, he would allow a woman to touch him. He would let women ask questions. He would respond to them. He healed women. He paid attention to the children. Suffer the little ones to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Now you say, that, that's, that, that's normal for us, but not for the Jews of his day. But women were not very high on the l list, you know, the social list. Um, the Greeks did not have very high regard for women. The Romans certainly didn't. And uh, we can't say much about the Jews and their, where they held women. Uh, a Jewish man would commonly pray a prayer, Lord, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile and I'm not a woman. That's, that's how they would pray. And Jesus was breaking that tradition by intermingling and having conversations with women, healing women, and allowing children to gather around him. Another thing that he did was dine with sinners. It was a Jewish custom. It was against the law for a Jew to enter into the house of a Gentile. But Jesus would minister to sinners and he would heal those who were sinners. Holy men were not supposed to dine with sinners or talk with women, but Jesus did both. And he healed on the Sabbath. There were very strict traditions about the Sabbath in those days. He declared people forgiven of their sins. That was blasphemy in the eyes of the Jewish leaders because only God could forgive sins. And there's much more we could list this morning, but we don't have time. I'm just making the point that even in his actions and the way he interacted with people, that he was breaking tradition of Jewish teaching and their understanding of the law. So I think at this point in the sermon, Jesus was, had sensed, he, he knew the hearts of people. And he's sensing that some of the listeners thought he was advocating that he was going to throw out the Old Testament law. So we come to this part of the text, and he continues, and he makes this unforgettable disclaimer that really kind of shocks, the, I think, the Jewish leaders. But it sets down for all time his position on the law and the prophets. And that's where we pick up in verses 17 through 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now let me just quickly explain the jot and the tittle. This is very, these are very unusual words for us, even in our English language. But he was speaking of the, the numerous tiny extensions of Jewish letters 
in the old Hebrew Old Testament. And there were thousands of these little tiny extensions. Do we have a Jewish friend with us here today? A friend with Ken. He's from California. We've been visiting each Sunday. And uh, he, we talk about some of the Jewish traditions. And he, he, he understands this because he has a, a better grasp of the Hebrew certainly than any of us do this morning. But he, he would understand these tiny marks in the Hebrew language. And one little mark can change the meaning of an entire word. For example, in the English language, we, we see our C. We know the little curve, the C. But when we add a little line to the top of it, it changes that. That one little mark changes C to an entirely different letter in our alphabet. And in the Hebrew Bible, there were thousands of these. And Jesus is saying, we're not even going to change. I've not come to abolish or change any of those. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Even though some would later teach, some false teachers would pop up in the first and second century that Jesus came to overthrow the law. It's clear here from Christ's opening words that he came not to set aside the law and the prophets, not to destroy it. I've come not to annul the law, but I've come to fulfill it. Now, later Jesus would counter many of the Pharisees' popular sayings. And we'll see those in a few weeks. And I've already alluded to that. We'll come to those sayings where Jesus will say, you've heard it said, but I tell you. Now, what is that? Because it sounds like he's changing something. Well, there Jesus was saying... I've not come to abolish the law, but I am going to correct the perversions that the scribes and Pharisees have made of the law. Because by the time of Christ, there were many, there were hundreds of things added to the law, like Sabbath day restrictions, hundreds of different added restrictions to make it even harder for the average person to fulfill that expectation, that part of the law. Jesus is saying, I've not come to abolish that, but I want to correct some perversions. Carl F. Henry, one of the great theologians, he just says it so succinctly. This is what he says Jesus is doing. What he criticizes, I'm quoting, is not the law itself but contemporary first century formulations of the law. He's going to correct those. Now, what do we do with, when we speak of the law? And Jesus coming to fulfill the law. We have to understand that there are different parts of the law. What do we do, for example, concerning the ceremonial laws? We just spent in, in, several months studying the moral law, right? We study the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. And I define that as the moral character of God written in human language. And it stands for all times. It's not to be done away with. It applies to us today as it did to those of old. But what about the ceremonial laws like Sabbath day restrictions and the dietary restrictions and those things. What about those? Jesus says that he has come to fulfill those. I've come to fulfill all of those ceremonial laws. If he is the Messiah, if he is the Lamb of God, if he is truly what the writer of Hebrews says, the one who has come to shed his blood once for all, if he is the true Messiah, then why on earth would we need any more lambs or rams to be slaughtered? I've come and I've fulfilled all of that. Those, all those dietary restrictions... Might be good for some of you to try them out, you know. They're not going to hurt you. But I fulfilled all of those ceremonial cleansing laws. Why? Those were just 
Those were things I, I had the people do. They were pictures to remind the people that they were sinners and they needed to be cleansed. I've come as the Messiah to wash away your sins. You are clean because of the blood that I've shed for you. So Jesus comes to fulfill those ceremonial laws. But back to the law, the moral law of God, and we speak of the law and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures. I want to just share with you, and this is all I'm going to do today, is several ways Christ fulfills the law and the prophets. And the first one is the most important. In fact, we could, we could say this one and, and have really no need to mention the others. Because this is the most important. And you know the answer. How did Christ fulfill the law? How did he fulfill the law? First of all, he fulfilled the law by dying on the cross. Satisfying the demands of the law against those who would believe on him. The entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament period points to Christ. You can look at every chapter in the Old Testament, every verse in the Old Testament, preach Christ. It points to the coming Messiah. Listen, Hebrews 9.22, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's a quote from the book of Leviticus. The, the, the Israelites, the Jews knew that. They knew there needed to be a shedding of blood. The writer of Hebrews tells us, reminds us, that blood must be shed. And thanks be to God, blood was shed on Calvary once and for all. And that's the most important and the main way that Christ fulfills the law and the prophets. But he does it in other ways too. He fulfilled their, all the messianic predictions of the prophets in the Old Testament. For all the prophets in the law prophesied. The Bible says, for all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. That's John the Baptist. I want you to look over in chapter 11, verse 13. Matthew included this. He's making a point. The same point I'm trying to make with you this morning. 11, verse 13. I want to show you. These are not my words. These are the words of God, Jesus Christ. Verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now what did Jesus mean by that? For all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. Well, Matthew helps us. Look over Matthew chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3. Listen to this. Matthew 3. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. And say, uh, verse 3, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John is simply saying, The time has come. If you will, a new dispensation has begun. The law and the prophets now, have, that time has passed. Christ has come. It's a new time, and he has fulfilled all of the law and the prophets. The long-awaited Messiah is here. And he's the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures and all of their prophecies. The kingdom has come in
Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.